Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I kind of like the change of weather we've had, so enjoying the cool off. So I'm not going to preach at you about you need to exercise more, you need to eat less, because nobody likes to hear that. It's, so you've all heard that plenty over the last 40, 50 years, because that's kind of been the message. Um, so kind of have a different take on it. Um, how many have heard of nutritional ketosis? As, okay, a few of you. So, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. Fat is fat. Uh, my son told me you're not supposed to use that fat term anymore. He said it's not cool. So, <laughs> but as a parent, I don't try to be cool anymore. So, um, so we'll kind of move through. Um, one of the things that motivated me to look deeper into the issues of nutrition um, is the fact that this, first, this is one of the first generations of children that are predicted to have a shorter lifespan than, than their parents. Um, and I don't think that's, that shouldn't happen, especially in the United States where we have access to you know, a land of plenty, which is kind of what has gotten us into this problem in the first place. But, um, so this is from, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Fed Up or the documentary Fed Up. It's a very good documentary, and they talk a lot about children, obesity issues with children, school lunch programs, um, and kind of how they're negatively affecting the, the health of our children. Uh, so that's kind of what, I guess, my motivation is. I have two children, so and I want to, hopefully they are able to live long, happy, healthy lives. So, um, so we're going to start kind of with a, the basis of where we got our nutritional guidelines. I don't actually know if the bunny's name was Mr. Cinnamon, but it seemed like a good name for him. If I would have been Dr. Nikolai, I would have named him Mr. Cinnamon. So, um, so that's Mr. Cinnamon to us right now. But in 1913, this is a, Dr. Nikolai was a Russian um, physician, and he studied the effects of dietary fat, spe specifically animal proteins, on rabbits. So after feeding rabbits a steady diet of animal proteins, animal fat, he then would cut them open and discovered that they had plaque in their arteries. So he was one of the first people to discover um, plaque in the arteries. So, does anybody see an issue with that experiment? Feeding rabbits meat, is that an issue of any sort? Yeah, rabbits aren't meant to eat meat. So of course it's going to have negative effects on their body. I mean, if you were, if you had took a lion and fed it steady diet of grass, that lion probably would have had <laughs> ill effects as well. So the science was a little bit flawed from the beginning. Um, but he did discover plaque in the arteries and things like that. And when he did discover the plaque, when they did an analysis of it, saturated fat was part of that plaque. And so from that point on, saturated fat kind of got demonized because it, was, it just happened to be there. Um, and I've heard people say that's kind of like blaming the fire department for lighting fires because they're always at fires. So and that's kind of the same thing with saturated fat. It just happened to be there. Um, and so it was blamed for, from there on out for those plaques that were building up in the arteries. Um, so we can, that's kind of when it got its start, 1913, that was quite a while ago. And we move up to the 50s. Um, Ansel Keys up here in the left, my, your left, he kind of came up with the diet heart hypothesis that the carbohydrate, or the, when we eat cholesterol, fatty foods, specifically animal proteins, that it causes plaque buildups in the arteries. Um, and he did the famous Seven Nations study, which you see over here. This is what he published as a Seven Nations studies. But over here is his results from the actual 22 countries that he studied. But he neglected to report all of those in his report. He just took the ones that made a nice, clean sweep through there to basically solidify the point that he was hoping to make. So we call that cherry picking, and you're not supposed to do that as a scientist. Uh, you're supposed to let the facts guide you. And he guided the facts, basically. So, so this is the results. From those results, of course, you can see there's a pretty good correlation between the intake of um, fat and the increased risk of death for cardiovascular disease. 
But if you throw in all of the countries, it kind of loses its, you know, its validity. So, so that's one thing I always stress to people is to be cautious, be skeptical of scientific data. Um, always look deeper into it. But Ansel Keys did quite well with this study. Um, he started the study in 1956, ended it in 1970, and then he kind of became an advisor for the United States with Mr. McGovern when he started the first dietary guidelines that we had in 1977. Um, and in those dietary guidelines, we were told to eat less fat and cholesterol and eat more carbohydrates. And now those, that was based on what Ansel Keys came up with in his research. Um, and at the time, McGovern was told by several scientists, nutritional um, professors, scientists, that they didn't have enough data to make this type of recommendation. Because, I mean, this is a sweeping recommendation for the entire population in the United States. And they said, we don't have enough data to, to support those changes. And his quote was that, as a politician, we don't have the luxury of time like a scientist. We don't have the time to wait for the results. So they had, he just pushed it forward without having the full benefit of the results. So, so it was pushed forward. And we have the dietary guidelines that we have today, which have just went through a pretty major renovation. Uh, 2015, I think the result, full results are supposed to come out in the next few months or so. Um, so Ansel Keys got on the cover of Time magazine for his diet heart hypothesis. Um, George McGovern lost to Richard Nixon in 1972, I believe it was. So, yeah, I, I taught for a year at Dakota Wesleyan. Everything on Dakota Wesleyan campus is named after George McGovern. So, um, John Yudkin in 1972 published a book, Pure, White, and Deadly. He was probably the biggest opponent of Ansel Keys. He believed that our issue was not from animal fats, proteins, carbo and cholesterol, but more from sugar. So he published his book in 1972, Pure, White, and Deadly. He's a British um, nutritionist professor. He's the one who started, I think, the Queen's College of Nutrition. Pretty sharp guy. Um, and he confronted Ansel Keys with about the Seven Nation Study. Um, and Ansel Keys, from what I understand, was not a very cordial guy. He was not a very nice scientist as far. He didn't like someone you know, disagreeing with his, his findings. And so he basically started dragging John Yudkin's name through the dirt and to the point where Yudkin just gave up and said, fine. You know, he, so the squeaky wheel got the grease. Well, not the grease in this case, I guess. He didn't want grease, but um, <laughs> got the carbohydrates. So Dr. Yudkin was sent on his way because he refuted the he told Ansel Keys that his facts did not match his theory. And these are some quotes from Stephen Hawking, who's also a pretty intelligent fellow. Um, it's always best to put smart people in your PowerPoints that have smart things to say. <laughs> so, but he, the facts did not fit the theory, but Ansel Keys decided to ignore that. Um, and basically, in the end, in 1992, we were presented with the Food Guide Pyramid, which I think is a creaking and ugly edifice, as Stephen Hawking calls it. And that's what we were left with in the early 90s. The Food Guide Pyramid has went through some changes since then. This is the first one we had in 1992. And then we had it updated, I think, 10, 10 years later. And now we have the, the My Plate. And I think they're all equally useless when you look at them. I, I've, Never seen the point of them. I mean, they're dietary guidelines. I don't think they're very good dietary guidelines. And plus, I don't know how many people follow them. Do you guys, I mean, when you cook supper at night, do you have the nutritional guidelines in front of you to make sure you get appropriate amounts of this or that? Nobody really pays attention to them. But So a lot of people will say, What's, who cares about the nutritional guidelines if nobody really pays attention to them? But there are people that have to pay attention to them, that are forced to eat according to the nutritional guidelines. Uh, does anybody think of anybody that's fed by the government? Is there any programs out there that school children? 
There's about 30 million school children every year that are fed according to these guidelines. The senior center here. Okay. Senior citizens. Nursing homes. Nursing homes. Uh, or the, what was I going to say? The people on WIC. There's about 7 million people on WIC that are basically forced in some way to follow these guidelines. Um, welfare. Food stamps, there's about 28 million people that are on food stamps. Prisoners, people that are incarcerated, there's about a million and a half people or so in jail. Uh, so altogether, there's, there's close to 70 million people that are required to follow these guidelines through. And that's equal to about 20% of our population. So that's a pretty, pretty good chunk of our population that has to follow these guidelines. We don't have to follow them, but there are people that do have to follow them. Because um, I used to say the same thing, what's the matter? I don't have to follow them. But there are people that do, so we need to keep them people in mind when we're <clears throat> discussing these. So, so we went from the food guide pyramid to the my plate, um, and we'll see how long that lasts. We have our new, like I said, our new guidelines are to come out shortly. There's, we have a briefing on them so far, but not the full extent. It's like a 600-page document, so I don't know who's all going to wade through that, but. Um, so we followed Ansel Keys' advice, we followed the McGovern guidelines, we ignored Yudkin's advice, and this is kind of what, what we got. So we start here, and you can see this trend upwards for the obesity rates in the United States. Could be a coincidence, I don't know, maybe not, I don't think so, but. So. And also in 1974, there were approximately four million Americans that had type two diabetes. Um, nowadays, that's closer to 30 million. So that is, went up, used to be about 2% of the population with type two diabetes. Now there's about 9% of the population that has type two diabetes. In 1980, there, what the type two diabetes used to be called? Was it adult onset diabetes? Why don't they call it adult onset diabetes anymore? Yeah. Exactly, we have children that have it. In 1980, there were zero cases reported by the CDC for children with type 2 diabetes. Zero. Nowadays, there's close to 60,000. So we went from zero to 60 in, in a pretty short period of time. Um, a lot of people point to different reasons for that. They say we're not as active. Uh, we eat too much. You know, gluttony and sloth are the two things they always throw out there. We eat too much and we don't move enough. And that's a pretty simple answer. And if it was that simple, I don't think we would have this issue. And that's kind of the way I used to think as well. I used to do personal training and stuff like that. And that was sort of always kind of the sweeping um, remedy to everything was you need to move more and eat less, which those two don't go together. What happens when you move more? You get hungry. So I mean, you're telling somebody to exercise more and eat less, you're basically setting them up for miserable failure. Um, and also physical activity has been shown to be a pretty horrible way to manage weight. Um, there's, most studies show that physical activity is a very inadequate way to manage weight to lose weight. Most of the time, weight management, weight loss is about 10% nutrition and about 90% um, exercise. So that's quite an imbalance, but we've kind of ignored that for a long time. And they've done a lot of studies with children it, that come from schools that have nine hours a week of PE compared to schools that have one hour a week of PE. There's no difference between the BMIs of those children that come from, either have nine hours a week or one hour a week. There's absolutely no difference. Because they found that the kids that have nine hours a week of PE in school, they move less out of school. The ones that have one hour of PE in school move more out of school. So it all evens out, they all move about the same. So, because that's another thing that always, people always pop up and say, well, we need more PE in the school. We need more hours of PE in the school. Um, I'm completely supportive of having jobs for health and physical education instructors, but um, I don't think preaching on PE is the way we need to go. I think they need to focus more on the nutritional side of it. Uh, they need both, but as much as I love dodgeball, it doesn't teach you a lot, of, teach you some life lessons, but it doesn't teach you much about, you know, <laughs> nutrition. So. Um, Another interesting thing is with our doctors who we entrust with our health, they, most of them get about a three hour course in nutrition. 
So our doctors don't have a lot of nutritional training. And they're starting to change that a little bit now. They're starting to bump that up so that they have a little bit more training in um, nutritional, which you think would be common sense. But. So Dr. Yudkin with his book in 1972 said we have a problem with sugar. This is the numbers as they are nowadays, which obviously we do have a problem with sugar. 152 pounds a year is the average American consumes of sugar. That's it's like a medium-sized person. Um, back in early 1900s, it was about 50 pounds, 40 pounds or so of sugar. So a lot of people talk about, you know, in, in Japan, they eat a lot of white rice and things like that, that why aren't they fat? Well, they do eat a lot of carbohydrates, but they don't eat as much sugar. They eat about maybe 30 pounds of sugar a year. So. So it all comes, sugar doesn't act the same in the body as other calories. And that's another thing, Cal a calorie is not a calorie. We've been told that for years, you know, protein, fat, carbs, calories a calorie, that's not true. They all act differently in the body. 80% um, of the 600,000 food products in the US have added sugar. I mean, it's in everything. Jerky has added sugar. I mean, everything you look at has added sugar to it. Um, and it comes in all these different names. There's, there's probably a hundred different names it comes in. And it doesn't matter if it's natural sugar, it doesn't matter what the name is, it acts the same in the body. It causes a spike in insulin, it causes, and that's kind of where the root of things are, that big spike in insulin that we get from sugar. And it doesn't matter if it was natural sugar or honey or whatever it is, it's gonna cause that, have that same exact effect. And so it's hard to kind of keep track of where sugar is, what it's called. Um, it's frustrating for people that are trying to read labels and find, take care of their health. Um, people that don't have time to study and wade through all this information and read all this information. You know, they rely on doctors and scientists to tell them what they're supposed to eat and that changes all the time. Um, one week time, or one year time life will have on its cover that butter will kill you. The next year they'll have Butter is the best thing you can eat. So um, people get frustrated with one year you should eat eggs, one year you shouldn't. Um, so the sugar, like I said, it's in everything. Um, gushers, which are pretty tasty. My son used to eat those when he was younger. But we're, you think, you know, I'm going to eat healthy. The first thing you do, you buy a bunch of yogurt, you buy a bunch of, you stock your fridge up. But you could just as well be eating a sack of Gushers. It, your body's going to react the exact same way whether you've eaten Gushers or yogurt. Your body has the same exact reaction. There is other types of yogurt that are better that have no sugar in them, natural yogurts. Those are better for you. Um, bag of M&Ms compared to spaghetti sauce. I mean, I don't know why we need that much sugar in spaghetti sauce. but um, So it's in everything. So you've got to be really diligent if you're trying to cut back on your sugar intake. I've never tried dumping M&Ms in potato. In that, but, uh, <laughs> might not be bad. So, instead of meatballs, you'd have M&Ms. So. And so all this sugar, that the 152 pounds we eat a year, has kind of led to this point, insulin resistance, which is under the surface. We have all these diseases and issues above the surface that we're trying to treat. Um, and as, Treating these is doing no good. If we continue to treat those, we're gonna to continue to treat those. That's kind of just, it's gonna be a continuous cycle of trying to treat the same thing and getting the same results. Um, and all of us have varying levels of carb tolerance. Some of us can eat 300 grams of carbs a day and be fine. Some of us maybe only can eat 20 grams of carbs a day and be fine. So it has, in some of us, it generally changes over our lifespan. A lot of athletes, we talk about carb loading. I taught, I've taught sports nutrition for over 10 years and the carbohydrate chapter, I always taught carb loading was a good means to um, store up energy in your system for endurance events. And we can hold about 2000 calories worth of energy in our system if you rely on sugar and glucose for that. Uh, if you rely on fat for that fuel, you can store, the normal person can Average size has over 50,000 calories at their disposal if you can access that. Um, 
Has everybody heard of bonking? When someone runs a marathon, about two hours in, they bonk. Because that's about how long you can get on 2,000 calories. Well, I can't get a full marathon in 2,000 calories, but those that are highly trained can get about two hours worth out of it. Otherwise, you have to keep on putting more and more carbs in as you go to keep from bonking. So a lot of athletes will be down here at carb tolerant most of their lives. And then, you know, they were marathon runners, they were track athletes, they were carb loading all the time. Um, maybe they're still running marathons at 45, 50, but they start to develop type 2 diabetes, even though they're active, fit, because basically their pancreas is crapped out. Their pancreas just can't do it anymore. Because your pancreas is what pumps out the insulin when we eat carbohydrates, um, and it can't can't continue forever. It will, for some people it's fine, but for other people, eventually their pancreas will just throw in the towel. And, they, um, and you see that a lot. We've seen it a lot more with um, middle-aged marathon runners, ex-marathon runners, people that we look like, they're pictures of health. You know, they're slim, trim, but, because we always, you know, we always rely on the outward appearance more so when we look at obesity and things like that and health issues. And I found this quote, I'm not sure who said it, humans are the only species intelligent enough to manufacture their own food and dumb enough to eat it. Um, I thought that was, that kind of comes back to the diet that I would recommend is more, a lot more natural foods that aren't manufactured. Um, the three foods, carbohydrates, you know, especially processed carbohydrates, um, vegetable oils and sugars, those are the three, big three that cause a lot of inflammation in the body and lead to a lot of these issues up here. So. And so by 2050, it's estimated that one out of every three of us will have diabetes. That's quite a few people. But Professor Noakes says if we were to go low carb, high fat, we'd put about six pharmaceutical companies out of business. So. And that's one thing, it's not in the best interest of pharmaceutical companies, of healthcare companies, for us to be healthy. They rely on us being sick and unhealthy. But if we were, Dr. Noakes is a huge proponent of low carb, high fat diet. Um, and he's been drugged through the mud by his peers and by other scientists for years, but he, he sticks to it because he believes what he says. And he's got close to 600 peer reviewed journals out there. He's a pretty intelligent guy. He's pretty active in research. Um, so he's one person I would check out if you're interested at all in this type of thing. So low carb, high fat. A lot of people when they hear low carb, high fat, they initially think of Atkins diet. They always think that you walk around all day with bacon in your pockets basically is what they, what they think of. As much as I love bacon, it stains your clothes. You don't want to put it in your pockets. But um, you know, it doesn't mean, high, high fat does not mean high meat necessarily. It means high fat. You know, you, if you eat meat, you want it to be high in fat. You know, we've been told since the 80s, low fat everything. You know, the 93% lean beef, um, which I go for the 80% lean because you want that fat in there. That's, that's what, because if you eat high, you don't want high protein, you want moderate protein. You want high fat. And we'll talk a little bit more about that to come here. So, so I think 2050 is not, all that far away, um, and I would much rather put some pharmaceutical companies out of business than have one out of three of us have diabetes. So this is kind of what the ketogenic, I put some of the terms over here because it's probably new to a lot of people, the ketogenic type diet and the terms themselves. It's not something new, it's been around for roughly uh, two, three million years. It's kind of the diet that we, were, we evolved on. We ate, there wasn't a lot of vending machines with chips and stuff back in the caveman days. They basically had animals to eat. They had some plants, um, not a lot of carbs. They didn't have a lot of fruit available to them. Fruit was available for probably a couple months out of the year. Um, and it's interesting when you look at the change from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic, they went from more of the hunter-gatherer to more of the farmers. And 
the average height went down about six inches between those two, just from eating less animal fats, animal proteins, and eating more carbohydrate-based diets. So, but I'll leave that lecture up to the biology department. They, they can handle that. So, but this is kind of the basis. If you want to look at kind of a quick and dirty pyramid of what a ketogenic type diet is based on, a low carb, carb high fat way of eating. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to shift your energy use from a fuel source from glucose to fat. Um, and our bodies are pretty efficient at burning either or, but we just can't switch off and on like, a, you know, it'd be much more convenient if we were like a hybrid car that would just flip back and forth whenever we could. But it takes anywhere from a week to three weeks for somebody to get into a ketogenic state or become keto adapted. And, it, and they can do that by eating this type of diet. Um, you know, lots of fat, basically. 80% of your calories should come from fat when you eat this type of diet. And we'll look at kind of the chart that shows the difference with that. But you want to stay away from the grains, carbs, sugars especially, starches as well. Everybody's a little bit different when it comes to how much pasta and things like that they can handle. But basically everything over here causes a spike in your insulin levels. And when your insulin levels go up, all the fat in your body is held hostage. Fat can't get out of the fat cells if there's insulin there. Fat's job, or insulin's job is to push fat into the fat cells. So if insulin is present, fat's not going to get used. It's going to get stored. And once it's stored, our body doesn't like to give it up because evolutionary-wise, our bodies were meant, designed to hold fat when they got it. So our body was much, would much rather give up a little bit of lean muscle tissue than fat. So you can see these are the foods on the left, the yes foods. So you can see lots of butter, lots of saturated fats, good fats like coconut oil, um, some vegetables, got your meats down here, meat, fish, chicken, different cuts of meat. Um, berries are probably the best. Basically, foods that are low on the glycemic index. So if you have questions on what foods you should or shouldn't eat, you know, you can also look at the glycemic index, which ranks food as to how, what effect they're going to have on your body as far as insulin levels when you eat them. Where white bread is basically the top. That's kind of number 100 on the glycemic index. Um, broccoli would probably be like closer to zero. So, so foods that are lower, like berries, are good. They're lower glycemic index fruits. So they won't cause that big spike in insulin. Um, any questions on this pyramid yet? Makes sense? It's really not that complicated. Um, and I don't like to call it a diet, because to me a diet is something that's temporary. Something that you do for a few weeks to get ready for a class reunion or something like that. Um, it's always fun going to the class reunion and seeing all the gaunt people walking around that have been <laughs> starving themselves for weeks. Um, but I got started with this type of diet a little over a year ago. I was preparing for my carbohydrate lecture in sports nutrition class, the same as I had been teaching it for 10 years. Um, getting ready to talk to them about carb loading, um, getting ready to talk to them about how stupid Dr. Adkins was, how dumb low carb, high fat was. You know, I was getting ready to do my, my spiel on staying away from those types of diets. And I stumbled upon Dr. Peter Atea's site. He's a pretty intelligent guy. He um, also believes in the low carb, high fat way of eating as a, the healthiest way of eating. And I started reading his site and he, kept talking about inflammation, inflammation with the insulin levels and things like that. And it was really interesting reading. And the more I was reading, I started thinking back to myself. I have, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what psoriasis are. It's an audio, autoimmune issue where you, basically it's like um, you get these plaque builds up on your skin and things from just your system goes wild. Um, and I could remember my dermatologist talking about inflammation. And it was kind of like a, the light went on. Everybody has those aha moments. And suddenly I felt I was happy that I discovered it, and I was, felt stupid that it took me this long to discover it. Um, I wanted to call every student that I'd had for the previous 10 years and apologize <laughs> for, for what I'd told them. 
Um, and so I started on a, basically a ex self-experiment, an N1 study of one. So I stopped taking the medication that was prescribed for psoriasis without <coughs> consulting my doctor, which you probably shouldn't do, but, because um, the, the medication that they, one of the medications I was on is called Humira. I don't know if anybody's heard of Humira. It's an injectable anti-inflammatory that they use for people anywhere from arthritis to Crohn's disease to ulcerative colitis. It's a really strong anti-inflammatory. And so I was reading the, the label on it and the side effects, and there was two side effects that kind of caught my eye. One of them was increased risk of all types of cancer, and the other one was death. And those, those were pretty serious side effects. So <coughs> I thought, why am I taking this? I mean, it, it did get rid of my psoriasis. I'll give them that. I mean, I, take an injection of that, a week later, everything's fine. But I thought, I Googled the internet to see if anybody else had tried this type of diet for psoriasis, since it is a <laughs> inflammation, and I couldn't really find anything. So I just jumped into it. And one Monday morning, I got up and had ground pork, about a quarter pound of ground pork, three eggs, all fried in butter, and then I went to work, instead of eating my normal bowl of cereal that I used to eat every morning for the previous 40 years. Um, and I started, you know, usually the way I used to eat, I'd have a bowl of cereal, a glass of juice, and then two hours later, you know, I was hungry again. I'm digging through my office drawers, trying to find a cliff bar or something like that. Because you get that hangry feeling, everybody ever had a hangry feeling where you're hungry and angry at the same time? <laughs> and that's usually what you get when those big spikes of it, glucose and insulin, they go way up, then two hours later they crash way down. Um, so you go through that throughout the day. I would, throughout the day, I just thought that was normal, that every two hours I had to find something to eat. Um, which, looking at it from the evolutionary side, we wouldn't have made it this far if we had to eat every two, two hours because it'd be pretty dangerous to leave the cave every two hours to try and find something to eat. So, but that's the way I ate for, and that's the way a lot of us eat. A lot of athletes eat that way. You know, they're constantly putting in carbs every few hours. Um, so every two hours, I'd have that big rise, big crash, you know, two or three in the afternoon, feeling shot. Always had that brain fog that you get where you can't focus on things. And so I started on this diet, like I said, that Monday morning. And I was sitting in my office working on stuff, had class, and I looked and it was two o'clock and I hadn't eaten yet since breakfast. And I wasn't hungry yet. And I was like, well, that's kind of odd. Usually I'd have eaten three times by now. And I still wasn't hungry. And the, so I waited, I ate when I got, home again at like six, and I still wasn't starving at that point. I could have probably went the rest of the night without eating, but um, so I started eating that way, and first thing I noticed was the mental clarity. I, did, I lost that mental fog that I used to get every, every couple hours. It was more of a steady, steady state, which I always said it was kind of like my mind was on jet fuel. It's kind of how I felt, because um, before I'd used to have my lecture notes in front of me all the time because I'd always forget things. And that, that was the first thing I noticed, that I, I found myself standing away from the podium more, because I didn't have to have my lecture notes in front of me to remind me of things. It was just, I just had that steady, steady state. Physically, I felt great. Um, you know, I was, I weight, weight lift a couple days a week, and I noticed I didn't lose any strength in weight lifting. Um, and I was losing weight, I lost like, 15 pounds, and I, that wasn't my purpose, was to lose weight. My purpose was to see if, how, what effect it had on my psoriasis. And my psoriasis went away completely. And I, have, I haven't taken the medication for over a year. I haven't had any psoriasis in over a year. Um, I ended up having to force myself to eat more throughout the day, though, because I was actually, my wife hates when I say it, but I was losing too much weight. Most people want to choke you when you tell them that you had to force yourself to eat more. But that was the way it was, because our bodies, if you give it fat, it burns fat. It's kind of like, you know, if you go out on the town the day of payday, you're more apt to buy your buddy around than if you go out three weeks later when you don't have as much cash on you. So your body, if you feed it fat, it keeps burning fat. And that was what I noticed right away that, um, you know, I had to force myself to eat so I didn't lose too much weight. Um, but I did lose about 15 pounds. Now I stay at about 10 below that. But the... Uh, uh, comfortable weight. I haven't lost any strength as far as aerobic activity. I haven't noticed any declines with that at all. Um, so it's, it was a positive experience for me. And a lot of people say, well, you can't sustain that. I'm like, why can't you? When I go to bed every night, I'm looking forward to breakfast. I never did that before because 
who's going to look forward to a bowl of grape nuts in the morning <laughs> when you go to bed? But if I, when I go to bed at night, I'm thinking, I get bacon, or I get leftover steak, or I get, um, you know, the, whatever I'm eating, and three eggs generally is kind of the main deal. I eat about close to two dozen eggs a week. Um, and a lot of people always think, well, cholesterol, what's your cholesterol level? And, and that's something else entirely that you want to look into if you're interested in doing this type of eating strategy. Um, and so, yeah, I had a pretty positive effect on me. And like I said, and usually for lunch, I'll eat, since I had to start forcing myself to eat lunch because I wasn't really hungry, I eat usually a huge salad for lunch. Um, and as far as dressing, I'll put about a quarter cup of olive oil on it just to get more fat. Um, all in all, and then I'll put apples, broccoli, whatever on top of that. And usually for supper, I'll have steak and maybe some more eggs or maybe some broccoli fried in. I, I keep a container of bacon grease in my fridge, kind of like butter. I put that in a pan and I saute my vegetables and that. Oh, it's tasty. My mouth's watering now, just thinking about it. But, uh, I mean, most diets, when you go on, you're not looking forward to meals. I mean, you're, you're miserable. I remember in the 80s when my mom was going through the grapefruit diet. She was not fun to be around. She was, I mean, she would eat like half a grapefruit in the morning, half one in the afternoon. I mean, it was, I don't know how many diets I've watched my mom go through. And to this day, she'll call me, have you heard of this diet? And I'm like, no, it's, it's not going to work. Um, but it's always fun to see the different types of diets that are out there. But, so this is just some kind of brief in, intro to ketosis. And this is kind of a comparison of the caloric intake by macronutrients. You can see over here, this is our average diet, our standard American diet, which I think the acronym is quite apt, SAD, SAD. Um, and this is even below what is recommended. It's recommended we get about 60% of our calories from carbohydrates. But this is kind of what the actual, what they've seen. Um, so this would be a ketogenic type diet. And this is more closely aligned to what we evolved on a couple million years ago, was this type of diet of 80% fat. And like I said, the protein, too many people always associate this type of diet with high protein, but you want to keep the protein moderate levels of protein. So carbohydrates, a big one. Um, these are macronutrients, the carbs, proteins, and fats. Uh, and people always talk about essential and non-essential nutrients. Carbohydrates is actually a non-essential nutrient. A non-essential means that you don't have to take it in from the outside because your body will make it on its own. So your body can make carbohydrates out of the protein and fat that you make. It's called gluconeogenesis. When you eat protein, and fats, it gets converted into, into it in your liver. So we don't actually have to consume any, I mean, you could survive the rest of your life without eating a piece of bread. Um, and trust me, I used to be a huge bread lover. Um, that's one thing, when my wife makes banana bread, I cave and I'll have a couple slices of that. But, so I'm not completely, you know, I don't have that much willpower. But <laughs> hot banana bread, you can't resist. Especially my son likes chocolate chips in it, so that's, that even bumps it up a little bit more. But, so this is kind of what you'd be shooting for. And what I could recommend if you were to try something like this would be to use one of those diet tracking sites like MyFitnessPal or one of those, um, just to kind of keep track of what you eat every day. And once you do it for a couple of weeks, most of us eat kind of on the same type of cycle. You'll know kind of where you're at. Because um, I actually take in more calories now than I did prior to it. Prior to it, I used to eat maybe 2,500 calories a day. Now I eat closer to 3,500 calories a day. But as they say, a calorie is not a calorie. You know, we always thought calorie restriction is what we had to do to lose weight. Um, and when you restrict calories, basically, eventually your body is going to prod you enough to make you eat because willpower only goes so far. Um, and this is ketosis. You can measure ketosis either through your breath, through your blood, through your urine. Um, I don't really bother measuring it. I just go by how I feel, basically. And that's what I think all of us should do, be more mindful when you eat. If you eat something and an hour later you feel like crap, don't eat that again. It's uh, being more mindful of what we eat, I think, is important as well. So, um, and so blood ketone levels should be right in this zone. 
And don't mistake ketosis with ketoacidosis. That's completely different. That is something that affects people who have type 1 diabetes, um, and it's a life-threatening condition. So a lot of people, when they hear the word ketosis, they automatically think of ketoacidosis. They're not the same thing. So don't, don't mistake those for, for one another. Because someone who's on a ketogenic diet will rarely get above three millimoles of ketones in their system. So there's no real danger of ketoacidosis. And this is just um, a study that showed the different effects that this a low carb, high fat diet has on um, different markers, healthy markers in your system. Um, we start with, you know, the insulin levels decrease, glucose levels, body mass, um, cholesterol levels, good cholesterol, which good and bad cholesterol, that's, those aren't really applicable terms either, but um, the LDL, everybody knows the HDL is what they always call the good cholesterol, and LDL they always call the bad cholesterol. Um, but there's actually two different um, particle sizes in the LDL. There's A and B. A is kind of a um, small or big fluffy one. B is more of a small dense one. And LDL-B is the one that's dangerous. That's the one that gets wedged in the arteries and causes inflammation and things like that. So, and those go down. The incidence of LDL-B goes down on this type of diet. So you can get a particle, when you get your cholesterol checked, you can get a particle size check. It's called a VAP test, V-A-P. I think it costs a little bit more than a regular cholesterol check. Um, but your total cholesterol will probably go up. But total cholesterol is, is not very meaningful. Basically, as it explained to me, knowing your total cholesterol is kind of like knowing the total score of a baseball game. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. Um, you don't know if it was a barn burner or if it was a blowout. So, and that's kind of something that's more telling is your tri triglyceride levels and your HDL cholesterol. So the ratio between those, between HDL and triglyceride should be about a one to one type ratio for the lowest. So leptin is a hormone that basically tells our body to stop eating and exercise. And that can, the, res the response of leptin can be blocked by insulin as well. Um, and so when you eat, when you're eating, that's what tells your brain we've had enough. And it's also what tells your brain we should go for a walk. Um, so if you've got insulin, lots of insulin present all the time, that's getting blocked. So that's what can cause the sloth we call. But, so insanity, this is a quote from Albert Einstein, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, this, this isn't a picture from a family reunion or anything. But, uh, <laughs> uh, this is how they used to test football helmets, and, uh, I guess. Uh, but these people look entertained over here. But, uh, but I wouldn't recommend it. So, and that's kind of what we've been doing over the years. We've been doing the same thing over and over. Um, here's just kind of a collage of all the different diet books, the different people that have been telling us that they can make us thin. Um, Richard Simmons, you can't go talk about diets and nutrition without talking about Richard Simmons. Um, Jack LaLaney, the juice tiger. Um, you know, there's these electronic things that you put on your muscles and it zaps them. I mean, most of these things are just ridiculous. Um, the cabbage soup diet. How miserable would you be on a cabbage soup diet? How miserable would everybody else in the house be on a cabbage soup diet? Um, so, I mean, there, Jane, I think it, it all started kind of with Jane Fonda in was that late 70s, early 80s. Um, and since from like 1980 to 2010, the fitness industry is it's more than doubled. I mean, we have, the fitness industry is huge. All these different products are around, but still we, our health keeps getting, going downhill. Um, you got all these gadgets that they sell on TV that you can find on any garage sale you go to. <laughs> and they work great for hanging clothes on, which most of them, that's what they're used for. Um, we have a, every year we have a neighborhood garage sale, and I love walking around just to count the number of much fitness equipment. It's kind of a little experiment they do every year. Walk around and look at the number of treadmills. I mean, people will pay 500 bucks for a treadmill, and then three years later, it's at a garage sale for 25 bucks, and then you go back 
when the garage sale's over and it's sitting on the curb with a free sign on it, because they just want it out of there. It's a bad reminder of their failed attempt at losing weight. Um, because physical, physical activity has been wrongly promoted as a weight loss method for years. You know, we, you need to work out more. Um, and it's just, just doesn't work that way. Physical activity is great for cognitive. I mean, I, there's no better thing to do for your body than physical activity for your brain and your body. So it helps with your cognitive thinking, um, you know, all those things. But it's not going to help you lose weight. So I remember my mom had this record, the Jane Fonda record. And she had those little string pulley things she hooked on the door. And she would lay there and move her arms and legs. Was, so. But now we're starting to see a change, which is encouraging. I think we're at a tipping point. I optimistically think we're at a tipping point. Just recently, the US, those new US guidelines, they're, they're getting rid of the limits on cholesterol because they've finally realized that there is no scientific data that supports the need for low cholesterol. That the cholesterol we eat does not go into our blood. There is no impact between dietary cholesterol and serum levels of cholesterol. Um, the Japanese government has also gotten rid of cholesterol limits. Sweden was the first country to, basically they had um, followed the same guidelines that we had set back in the 70s. A lot of other companies applied them. Our other countries had applied them. And Sweden's the first big country that has went low carb, high fat. They've basically gone away from the norm. Um, and they didn't just do that willy nilly. They did it over the course of three years, they had a group of people that looked at over 16,000 research articles on nutrition. Um, and that's what they came up with, that that was the best eating strategy for their population, was a low carb, high fat eating strategy. So it wasn't just Ansel Keys doing a research study. It was 16,000 different studies that they looked at. So, so to me, that was I think these are pretty positive things that we're moving in the right direction. And it doesn't take a lot of people to get that moving in the right direction, to tip that scale. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to do, is tip that scale a little bit more. Uh, back to my original reason for wanting to tip that scale in that direction. So, um, Any questions on nutrition? Anything I went over that was unclear or confusing or something you want to argue about? Or, um, it's fun to talk about nutrition because it affects all of us because uh, we have to eat. I mean, there's no way around it. Mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in this presentation because my husband and I have been following the ketogenic diet for a year and a half, and the benefits are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, I'm diabetic and I'm on insulin, I've been able to cut my insulin by 80% that I have to take. Um, both of us, uh, I had the VAP test for cholesterol mm -hmm. for the LDL. My LDL is the big fluffy particles yeah. that aren't sticky, so I don't have to go on a statin. My HDL went up, my husband's HDL had always been low, and they tried everything, and his went up to almost the maximum it's supposed to be for men. Um, I had acid reflux um, to the point where I had to have my esophagus stretched. They told me I'd be on Prilosec the rest of my life. After six months doing this, no more Prilosec. Uh, I've cut out several other medications. Um, my husband lost 50 pounds. He looks wonderful and everybody tells me how wonderful he looks. <laughs> I lost 30 pounds, but I'm still a work in progress. <laughs> I eat more, like you said. Um, before, I'm very short, and before if I ate one calorie over 1,200, I would put on weight. <laughs> now I eat close to 2,000 a day, and the weight will come off. So uh, there's tons of books, and you, you mentioned some of them that are great. There's one called um, um, Cholesterol Clarity that is really good by Jimmy Moore mm -hmm. that tell, talks about the different kinds of cholesterol. Um, there's Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. It yeah. talks about how insulin um, affects your weight. That it's really an insulin problem. Mm -hmm. Insulin is a fat storing hormone, which I didn't realize until. And that's what we see when people start on insulin; they gain weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, th this is great. I'm so glad you're doing this, and I do hope that 
more and more people will get into it. I'd like to see some more people in Shattered so we can have a support group or something. <laughs> but I, I've done it long enough now that it's not even a, I wouldn't eat the banana bread just because yeah. <laughs> I'm so used to low carb that my body doesn't accept mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And um, we're going to go on a cruise, a three week cruise, which, you know, cruising is all about eating. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm not even worried. I, I, I hope I'm not being overconfident, but I'm just not worried no, you, that I'm going to... And most of you find something to eat that well, yeah, is... Well, I mean, you can always figure it out. Yeah. So. Like when you go to fast food, just throw away the bun, things like that. I mean, I, don't, I mean, fast food meat is not the highest quality meat, but <laughs> if you're stuck there, you're going to have to eat it. Um, and another thing people always bring up, well, if they're vegetarian, you, if you're a vegetarian, you can still follow this type of diet. You just have to rely more on oils and things like that to get your fat content. Um, Nuts and oils, yeah. Whereas, but yeah, basically it looks at just total body, you know, the inflammation thing is the big thing. And most it, d disorders we have, their main cause is that underneath that glacier that we saw is inflammation is at the root. For arthritis, she mentioned acid reflux. Um, most type 2 diabetics are able to completely get off of their medications when they start this type of diet. Um, people that are, um, like you said, you had an 80% reduction in the amount of medication. So, I mean, it's, and that's kind of what we see throughout. And a lot of people will say, well, it's, you know, it's not a sustainable diet. Well, it was sustainable for a couple million years. It just happened to be the last 40 years we screwed it up that we, well, the government helped us screw us up, screw it up, but they don't, they don't do that very often, thankfully. But, uh, you know, 10 uh, years ago, like you were talking about, we didn't know as much about C-reactive mm -hmm. protein as we know now and the damage that it's doing to us, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. I'm confident that we're at a tipping point. I feel good about that we're not going to continue down this path. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see the new dietary guidelines that come out. I know they mention a little, I don't know if they talk about low carb, high fat much, um, but I think they still preach about you know lean meats and things like that as well. But Because um, it, takes, it takes a while to create change. I mean, we got into this mess and took us 50 years to get into it, it's going to take us a little while to get out of it as well. Um, but as, you know, as far as the, the issues that society faces with the ob obesity issues and all those types of deals, you know, it's forced us to kind of look closer at it. Um, and I think, you know, we've got some of these people here, Dr. Tim Noakes and Dr. Peter Atea, all these people here would be great resources for you to look at as far as this type of eating strategy and, um, and it doesn't have, not everybody has to drop as down as far as 5% of their calories from carbs. 5% is equal to roughly 50 grams or so of carbohydrate, which is a hamburger bun has 25 grams, a apple has 25 grams. So, but most people 50 grams is kind of where they want to start. They'll start at about 50 and some can move up a little bit and some have to go, drop down a little bit to stay at, at that state of ketosis. Um, and it all depends on what your goals are. If your goal is to lose weight, if your goal is to, um, like my goal was to get rid of psoriasis, and it, it just happened to, happened to work, which I was pleasantly surprised. And then when I went to my dermatologist a year later and had a checkup, she said, well, the um, Humira must be working. I said, well, I quit taking that. And I told her, she goes, oh yeah, that'll work too. I was like, why didn't you tell me that the, the year before? She, she'd been following a low carb, high fat diet for like 10 years. And I said, so why don't you tell your patients about the, you know, she, I mean, I wanted to strangle my dermatologist at that point that she didn't tell me about this earlier. Um, but I don't know if she wasn't, I don't know, I suppose she gets paid by the pharmaceutical companies, the same as everybody else that, so, um, so I mean, there's a lot of people that can benefit from this type of eating strategy. Is there any other questions regarding it that, that you had? I have one question. Can you mm -hmm. go back to the good food pyramid? Good food? Uh, Keto pyramid. It looks really expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean, I'm serious. I mean, yeah. it looks good, but it looks really expensive. Is there anyone working on the, any guru of how to do this on the cheap? I yeah, there is, a, there is a book that I saw that talked about ketogenic, you know, for the, the budget. And it, talked, you know, it talks about the low budget way. But, but yeah, and, uh, you know, these types of foods... Um, I haven't really noticed a difference in as far as my dietary budget as far as the way I used to eat as compared to this. It's pretty much the same because I don't 
don't have to eat every two hours like I used to. And, um, and I think you get more bang for your buck here. And plus, I don't have to spend, you know, the, the medication I was on was like $1,000 a year. So I got rid of that. I understand that savings in the long run. Yeah. Immediate. Yeah. Like, yeah, when I talk about people, though, budgets a little. Yeah. yeah. With garden season on, I noticed mm -hmm. that my grocery bill is way low because yes. I got everyone's tomatoes. Yeah. Um, Processed foods are curious. expensive, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is a little bit more. I mean, when I talk about this with college students, that's one of the things that I have to address is the, the cost of it that can be prohibitive for, especially if you're stuck eating in the cafeteria, you have to be a little more creative, which I've eaten over there and there is, you can eat this way. It just takes a little bit more creativity and it does, um, you know, we can't all go raid Ron's fridge in the middle of the night for, for beef, but. Uh. <laughs> I think it's possible. I, I I know I'm on several low carb Facebook groups, and this becomes an issue for for some people. But because there is a healthy discussion about how yeah, there it. there is. Okay. But um, you know, I was looking at the grocery store the other day. They had some meat that was two for one, and and um, I don't eat tons of protein. I, he said moderate. I eat about 60 grams of protein a day and 30 grams of carbs, and the rest is all fat. And um, so I think it's possible to do it on a budget. You just have to plan and look for good prices on things, and you know, with a little bit of work, you can you can do it. Yeah, because the cereal, I, was, I mean, a box of cereal is like five bucks or something. So I mean, I, and I would eat two boxes of cereal a week when I was, but so I mean, it was, and plus my family is thankful about that as well because. All those carbohydrates can have a gaseous effect on some people, so uh, it's made car trips a lot more <laughs> tolerable with me as well. So, um, Ron, Josh, uh, speak to us about carbohydrates from fruits. I, I notice here berries is at the very mm -hmm. uh, top of the pyramid, meaning limited intake. Yeah, the berries are more of a low glycemic index, whereas like a Grapes are really high. You got a lot more sugar content in grapes and things like in apple. An apple has about 25 grams of carbohydrates in it. Um, so I'll usually eat a lot of berries and then maybe a half an apple or something on my. But the so you can eat the the amount of fruit you eat can vary depending on what your carb tolerance is. But the biggest thing is that the fruit has the same effect as if you were eat a bag of Skittles or an apple, it would have the exact same effect on your insulin level. So it just depends on how insulin resistant you are and things like that. But so some people have to completely eliminate fruit from the diet because they're they're just that carb intolerant. But so yeah they are but I would look at the glycemic index scale and it just look and most of the berries like strawberries and blackberries are really low in the glycemic index. What about blueberries? Yeah blueberries are nice and low as well. So they don't cause a big spike in insulin and so in the, about two strawberries every three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, the, like the, the butter, um, you know, my favorite is the, the Kerrygold. Anybody ever had Kerrygold butter? That's, it's from grass fed um, Irish cows. You can eat it like a candy bar. It's, oh, it's <laughs> tasty stuff. But uh, yeah. But the uh, butter, um, and if you have trouble getting this much fat through the normal food you eat, there's also something that's been going around called bulletproof coffee. That's one of the names they call it. And it's basically you put about a tablespoon of butter, um, about a, two tablespoons of heavy whipping cream, and then a little bit of coconut, about a tablespoon of coconut oil in your coffee. And they call it bulletproof coffee. And it's one way to get, basically each cup is worth about 400 calories. Um, and you get about 80 grams of fat in that cup. So I mean, it's really high in fat and it's, Pretty tasty too. Um, so that's usually my, my fuel in the morning is a cup of bulletproof coffee with the, the butter floating around it. Yvonne, Yvonne hasn't tried it yet, but. So it's all blended nicely. I couldn't handle the butter floating. No, my wife tried it and she didn't like the, the butter floating around in there, but. Um, so that's one way just to help get more, because it's, you know, it is hard to eat, you know, that much fat. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I usually mix that in with the, so you get the coconut oil. Um, when you cook, you know, the vegetables or the meats, when you cook a steak, it's better to cook it in a frying pan in butter or olive oil or vegetable oil, not vegetable oil, 
than it is on a grill. Because on the grill, you lose all those minerals. If, I mean, it does taste good on the grill, but it's better, tastes even better in a frying pan with butter. And, um, and then the biggest thing is when you're done frying it is to dump out all that on it, all that juice you get, dump that back onto the steak because that's where all your minerals and things like that go is into the, the dripping. So, um, so you always want to dump that juice back onto the steak. Makes it, it's pretty tasty too. So. Yeah, or dump it on the salad. Um, when most people hear you talking about this, they think you're crazy. You'll never lose weight eating, eating all this fat. Um, I mean, on my salads, I'll put a good quarter cup of olive oil, and that's, you know, that's 500 calories almost of olive oil on a salad. It's, a lot le it's more calories than ranch, but it doesn't affect you the same way because it doesn't have the sugar. So. And the eggs, you know, eggs are kind of individual. Everybody likes their eggs prepared differently, but... I always like to fry mine in my leftover bacon grease. Um, and I recommend, if you can get your hands on farm eggs, I recommend those over, over the ones at the grocery store, but they're, they have a little bit, a lot more vitamins, minerals in them. Um, Ron's more of an expert on the content between grass-fed versus, versus the other, so. Josh, do you hmm? have a preference on animal protein source? I mean, where? Yeah. How it's raised or what it's fed. I prefer the grass fed. A friend of mine raises cattle, and I try and get my beef from him as much as possible. Um, and I, you know, if I'm at the grocery store, you never really know where it was. But I know from everything I've read about it, the grass fed has more, um, it's healthier basically. It's got more omega 3 fats in it than, than uh, so. But if you, I mean, if you're stuck eating, don't buy the, if you're at the grocery store, don't buy the lean cuts of, look for the ones that are nice and marbly. Um, you know, a nice marbly ribeye with the fried in butter. Nothing better than that. The, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I'm curious, why is heavy whipping cream in the yes and milk is in the no? Because milk has sugar added to it all the time. I mean, if you look at, especially skim milk, Anytime something has had fat removed, they've generally replaced it with sugar. And so like lactose is one of the sugars, whereas with heavy whipping cream, there's no added sugar. It's, it's all, it's all saturated fat, so. Yeah, so I haven't drank, I mean, I used to drink a gallon of milk about every two days and I stopped drinking milk as well. Um, and I went to my heavy whipping cream Mm -hmm. Why is diet soda on the yes? I mean, I diet mean, soda? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's probably not the best thing for you, but it's in comparison to regular soda, it's, it's a better alternative than... So I've, I've read studies that say that diet soda actually affects how your body processes mm -hmm. sweet things, yeah. um, that your body actually confuses sweetness yeah. and processes it incorrectly because of it. Is that not accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. Some people... Like some people can handle it all right, but other people, if they drink diet soda and things like that, basically it increases their cravings for sweets. Um, and also it has, it'll cause the same type of insulin effect on some people as it as a regular sugar would. So, so I mean, if, if you have to choose between, you know, choose soda, but if you, neither one is probably for the best, but I enjoy a diet Pepsi now and then, um, which now has no aspartame, which, they put that on there with absolutely no scientific evidence that aspartame was all that bad for you. But um, there, there we go again with the. But, but diet soda, like I said, it's, it's not a health food by any means. And like some people, like when I first started on this, I used the fake sugars, the sweet leaf, and all those, just to try and make that transition. I thought I needed that um, sugar because you get so used to it. I mean, 150 pounds of it a year that we most of us eat. Um, and sugar activates the same thing in our brain that cocaine does. It's, it, has, it lights up the same areas. And if you give a mouse the choice between cocaine and sugar, it'll choose sugar. It's harder to get a, someone off of sugar than it is off of cocaine because um, they activate the pleasure center in the brain. But when we eat it, you know, that activates that center. The next time we eat it, we need a little bit more of it to get that center activated. So it just kind of keeps going that way. So, so when you first start this type of diet, you know, I was looking for all these different sugar substitutes um, and in the end I ended up just 
getting rid of all of them because I didn't have that taste for that sweetness anymore. Um, like mixed nuts, the almonds are good, but I like the mixed nuts, but you want to get them so they're not roasted because anytime you get roasted nuts, they're roasted in vegetable oils. Um, and I'd forgotten how sweet tasting regular mixed nuts were because I remember growing up, my grandparents always had the big bowl of mixed nuts that you had to crack open. And uh, I'd forgot how sweet tasting regular mixed nuts were until I went back to eating those. So um, Target sells a nice big container of them. That's the only place I've been able to find the mixed nuts because I usually dump them on my salad as well, some mixed nuts. Um, but uh, Any other questions on... You know, you always feel free to email me or anything if you have questions about it. Um, if you want me to come shopping with you, I'll come shopping with you and look at foods. I have no problems with that. If you, um, and if you see me out and about and you're shopping, don't worry about me running up and throwing stuff out of your cart or <laughs> swatting cookies out of your hands when you're, because I, I mean, my kids eat, don't eat all that great all the time, but I, I tell them, but I don't tell everybody. Nobody likes the person sitting at the dinner table telling them that you shouldn't be eating that, you shouldn't be eating that. So, I mean, I don't care what people eat. The only time I care when people eat is when they're complaining about their health and they keep eating crap and they keep beating their head against the wall. That's when I care about what they're eating because they're not doing themselves any favor by keeping eating the same thing. I mean, like the quote from Einstein was, you know, we can't expect something different by doing the same thing over and over again. That's the only time when I'll question someone's nutritional intake. Uh, but I mean, you know, when people bring donuts into the office, I mean, that doesn't bother me. I just don't really care for donuts. But um, I mean, I've, I'll sit and watch my brother eat a bag of powdered donuts and not say a word because for one, it's impressive. I mean, <laughs> just, have you ever seen him eat one of those entire sleeves of powdered donuts? He can do it. <laughs> so, huh? You mentioned your grapefruit diet. Which one of those are? Oh yeah. Why did that work out? For my mom? Oh, not well. I, mean, it was, I think she was pretty hungry most of the time. I think tab came out at that time too. So I think it was like tab and grapefruit <laughs> and the grapefruit. What about the, the meal honey diet? You know, is a grapefruit diet as well, but it's is, all protein. Is it? And your salad and your grapefruit is just catalyst for the fats. Okay. So yeah, I haven't looked into that diet. I know they... Um, you have, you have um, two pieces of bacon and two eggs every morning with okay. half a grapefruit. And then for lunch and supper, you can eat as much meat as you want, as any way you want, and salad with a half a grapefruit. It's pretty low carb. You do it for 10 days, and then you get off for two days, and then for one more, you get back on it. Okay. And that's kind of what I like about this way of eating. It didn't take a lot of thinking for me to eat like this. Because I'm... I can eat the same thing day in and day out. It doesn't bother me. Um, some people need a little more variety in their diet, but I mean, I can, I can eat the same thing day in and day out, and um, I don't get bored with foods. Maybe I have no sense of smell either, so maybe that's what helps with that as well. That I can, I can get stuck on a diet and be fine with it. But, and it's interesting when you look at when you eat like that marbly ribeye I was talking about. If you pair that up, normally when you go to the restaurant, you get that with a baked potato. You know, if you eat the baked potato and the ribeye, your body's going to partition that fuel differently. The fat from that ribeye is going to get stored, and the carbs from that potato are going to get burned. Um, whereas if you eat that same ribeye with maybe some asparagus or some broccoli, then that fat from that ribeye is going to get used it's get, instead of getting stored. So a lot of it depends on, you know, the, how you pair your foods. Um, and all of us partition fuel differently, just genetically. Um, and I heard... Gary Tobbs, who wrote the book Good Calories, Bad Calories, talked about he had a picture of a Jersey cow and an Aberdeen cow. And he said, are we going to blame the, Jersey, the Aberdeen cow for being sloth-like because it's fat? And the Jersey cow, does it go jogging at night? Because it's, you know, everybody knows a Jersey cow, they're pretty slender because their fat is partitioned into their, in their milk production. And, and that's another thing. We all partition our fuel differently. We all come from different genetic backgrounds, um, you know, and that's, and learning more about this has also caused me to be a lot less weight biased. Because I mean, being an athlete and all those things, you end up being, end up being weight biased just towards people. You know, I always think, oh, they eat too much and they don't exercise enough. And that's not the case. It's, generally, it's the food that we're surrounded by has, you know, our environment is not conducive to losing weight. So, so it's helped me become a lot less 
weight bias and kind of understand the plight that all of us are in and the environment that we're in. The obesogenic type, or the, what do they call it? The obesogenic type environment that we're in. So, because I mean, there's fast food everywhere. There's vending machines everywhere. I mean, everywhere we go, we're surrounded by food that's not very good for us. Um, so. Any other questions? So that's one thing that I would also, you know, hope that some of you would come away with is being less judgmental of people because it's just not nice in the first place. But, uh, but that's what helped me a lot. The more I've learned about this type of diet and the more I've learned about how our body reacts to different foods, you know, it's caused me to be a lot less judgmental. Mm -hmm. Insulin management, and I was kind of wondering what role exercise played in that. I know that there's a connection. So. Yeah, exercise will also help lower insulin levels, um, but like I said, exercise, you know, it's not going to help anybody lose weight, but it's great for helping with insulin as well. And that's why athletes are able to to have a higher carb tolerance because they're active, so they're burning up a lot of that and keeping their um, insulin levels more in check than than someone who's maybe has a desk job or something like that. Um, and it was also ex explained to me that if, we, if you have to work out to maintain your weight, then you have to look at your dietary habits. You're probably, because that's, evolutionary-wise, that just doesn't make sense either, that we have to work out, because I don't think cavemen went out jogging or anything like that to maintain their weight. Um, so if you have to work out to maintain your weight, there's probably something wrong with your eating. And that was kind of the way I used, you know, I, I had to run every, other, every day, otherwise I felt like I was going to get fat because I would start to gain a few pounds here and there. I was more addicted to probably running than anything. But, um, but since I've been on this type of diet, I, I've walked more. I don't hardly run as much. So I'm not exerting as many calories as I used to. I'm eating more calories. But my weight, your weight will find kind of a happy medium. Eventually, you'll find that sweet spot in what you're eating and your activity level. Mm -hmm. So do you no longer teach that? athletes to carb load? No, I don't teach that anymore. I tell them about it because, you know, some of them, that's the way they've been taught, but I'll tell them about it and then I'll tell them this way and I'll let them kind of decide. Because every textbook on sports nutrition still teaches high carb. Um, and so, so I'll let them look at the textbook and kind of compare that to what I'm saying and they can kind of choose for themselves what which they want to follow. Because um, more and more athletes, they have this 100 mile runs and things like that, more and more of those athletes are, are using a low carb, high fat fuel, fueling system. And like I said, you get difference between 2,000 calories available to you or 50,000 calories av available to you. So I mean, there's a lot less chance of bonking when you're in a high fat. So, the way I was described to me is picture a semi truck that's got a big tanker behind it. And the fuel tanks that the truck is using is carbs and the tank that it's pulling is full of fat. But it, so that truck has to stop every few hundred miles and fill up that little tank, but it's dragging along that huge tank full of fat behind it that it can't access. And so that's kind of what ketogenic diet helps you access that big tank so you don't have to stop every and fuel up all the time. That was one way that someone explained it to me that made sense as far as being able to access the big tank. Any other questions, comments? Thanks for Thank you. coming in. Thank you.